Hello everybody, my name is Chris and I'd like to welcome you all back to our series called Blueprint for Composition. And for anybody who's new to the series by chance, if you're just watching for the first time, uh, I'd like to give a little overview quickly of what this series is all about. So it's called Blueprint for Composition because this series is not designed specifically for grammar instruction. My goal, my ultimate purpose is to help people improve their composition skills. So what I'm focused for the most part on is general ideas, principles, and rules regarding sentence composition and how to combine sentences together and how to combine ideas together in different ways that would make a person's writing more effective and a little bit more sophisticated and a little bit more advanced in terms of composition. So <clears throat> if perchance someone is writing an essay and this essay is a five paragraph essay, how to go about organizing the thoughts and combining the ideas together wherever possible to make the writing more effective and also more efficient. So along the way I will describe and discuss some grammatical issues that do come up from time to time that I happen to notice in students writings and um, in essays in general. But my ultimate goal is not direct grammar instruction. My ultimate goal is to have an impact on how well people can write their sentences in the forms of paragraphs. So in order to do that, <clears throat> we need to start at the foundational level. And by starting at the foundational level, we can then build up and expand our ideas further and in more advanced ways. <clears throat> so we have to start by understanding what are the basic building blocks of the sentence itself and how our sentence is organized and how our sentence is formatted and really what separates a sentence from a phrase or what sentence is as opposed to what a fragment is. So <clears throat> these types of issues we have discussed in previous episodes of this series. So I want to go back and just look at where we've been and then move on to another concept which is going to expand our repertoire even further. <clears throat> so going back to the very beginnings, the very basics of sentence structure and organization, <clears throat> we can say fairly clearly that sentences in English are combinations of clauses and phrases. So one thing you have to understand about English grammar and about writing in English in general is that there's not really anything that's a hundred percent certain in the sense that this is the rule and it applies 100% of the time. So we have to be a little bit careful not to mislead anyone into thinking that just because this rule says this that there are no exceptions because generally we like to joke among us English teachers that for every rule there's an exception. So even in saying this which is generally accurate of course that sentences in English are combinations of clauses and phrases it's not to say that every sentence must have a clause and a phrase. We have to define that a little bit more specifically because there could be sentences in English that do not contain phrases at all. And I gave some examples of that early on in this series. How a sentence could really be made up of two words, a subject and a verb, and that's it. So <clears throat> maybe it would be more accurate to say that generally speaking sentences in English are combinations of clauses and phrases. So I wanna, don't want to get into the minutia too deeply at this point, but we have to understand what is the difference between a clause and a phrase and how to identify different types of clauses and how to identify different types of phrases and then understand how the relationship is developed between a clause and a phrase to express and expand someone's idea. That I think is more important. So, just quickly, last few episodes of this series, we talked about different types of clauses. And <clears throat> at the beginning, we focused on the independent clause. And <clears throat> at that time, I described an independent clause as something that has a subject and a verb, at least one subject, at least one verb, and can stand on its own as a separate sentence. And it may or may not have a phrase. So again, most sentences in English do have phrases attached to them somewhere, but not all of them will have a phrase necessarily. So we have to be on the lookout anyway. What is a phrase? What is a clause? How are the ideas connected? So 
There are several different types of phrases. And again, what is the definition of a phrase? Well, a phrase has no subject and has no verb. It's a group of words that expresses an idea, yes, but it's not a complete idea by itself, and it does not have the essential ingredients of a clause, which is a subject and verb. So, when we talk about the independent clause, again, it has at least one subject and one verb, and if it's an independent clause, it can stand on its own as a separate sentence. We talked about that. We talked about different types of phrases. One type of phrase that we mentioned was the prepositional phrase, and we gave some examples of that in previous uh, episodes of this series. There are other kinds of phrases that you can identify. For example, gerund phrases. You can identify infinitive phrases. And there are other types of phrases we'll get into a little bit further down the road. Now, we also talked about two types of sentences. So, I'm going to jump down here for a moment just to review the two types of sentences. <clears throat> so, let's start with this one, number one here, which is called the simple sentence. And the simple sentence, as we said, is a kind of sentence which contains one independent clause only. So, a simple sentence again, is made up of only one independent clause. So it has a subject, it has a verb, it may have a phrase, and, or may not, but its most essential elements are a subject and verb, and it expresses a complete idea. So that would be classified as a simple sentence. And we did some practice with those. The second type of sentence that we talked about, number two, is called the compound sentence. So, the compound sentence we defined and explained has two independent clauses joined by a comma and a conjunction. So we spent some time describing the different types of conjunctions that can be used to join compound sentences together. And that was the example I gave was with the fanboys acronym. F for for, A for and, N for nor, B for but, <clears throat> o for or, Y for yet, and S for so. These are the common, what we call, coordinating conjunctions. They join independent clauses together to form a compound sentence. Now, for today, I want to introduce another type of clause which is different from the independent clause. All right? And that is something which is right here, known as the subordinate clause. And I will make a notation here that subordinate clauses can be referred to as dependent clauses. So these types of clauses, subordinate clauses, or sometimes referred to as dependent clauses, I prefer the word subordinate clauses because it's easier to distinguish between the independent clause uh, just in spelling. So the subordinate clause all right, so I'm over here. What distinguishes a subordinate clause or a dependent clause from an independent clause? So the subordinate clause has certain elements which are necessary to include in order to have what is known as this subordinate clause. So it starts with a subordinate clause connector. Okay? And then it has a subject. And then it has a verb. So also, I must point out that the subordinate clause by itself cannot be considered a complete idea. The purpose of the subordinate clause is to give extra detail or extra information or to show a relationship between ideas between the independent clause and the subordinate clause. So, we'll talk about that in a minute. Now, the subordinate clause connector, what does that mean? Well, like we saw with the compound sentence, there are certain types of conjunctions that are used to join two independent clauses together with a comma to show a relationship between ideas. Subordinate clause connectors are sort of like conjunctions. They act sort of like conjunctions. They are words that we use to show some kind of relationship. So there are subordinate clause connectors, for example, of time, of cause and effect, of contrast, etc the same way that certain conjunctions show cause and effect and contrast and addition and things of this nature. So, 
There are three different types of subordinate clauses. And today we're going to look at an example of one of them. So there are subordinate clauses which are called adjective clauses. There are subordinate clauses which are called adverb clauses. And there are subordinate clauses called noun clauses. So we're going to look at each one of these types of subordinate clauses, adjective, adverb, and noun clauses, in more depth and in more detail in future episodes of this series. But for today, I would just like to mention one type of adverb clause which shows cause and effect. And this, of course, is a very uh, common type of subordinate clause which begins with the word because. Okay, And we're going to show an example of how to connect the sentence idea together using the word because. So, when a sentence contains a subordinate clause and an independent clause in the same sentence, we call that kind of sentence a complex sentence. So over here you see, I put number three, complex sentence. So again, we have a simple sentence right here, one independent clause only. We have a compound sentence down here, two independent clauses plus a comma and a conjunction. And then the third type of sentence that we want to look at is the complex sentence. So the complex sentence does what? It contains one dependent clause plus one independent clause. So when you put the dependent clause and the independent clause together, combine those two ideas together, then you form what is known as a complex sentence. So let's take a look at an illustration of how this works. So. Down here, we have this example, okay? So focus down here for a moment. If we look at this example, we didn't have time, period. We didn't go to the pool, period, okay? What we are looking at here in this example are two simple sentences. Two simple sentences separated by a period, okay? One subject, we, one verb, didn't have, and it does express a complete idea. It actually expresses two complete ideas. We didn't go, uh, we didn't have time, that's idea one. We didn't go to the pool, idea two. So these are correct sentence <coughs> structures. Grammatically, the sentences are correct. So we don't have to worry about the grammar aspect of this. So like I said at the beginning of this particular installment, the grammar is not essentially my issue here, okay? I will explain grammatical rules and regulations as we go. But when we look at sentence composition, we're not looking at exactly, you know, individual grammar mistakes. We're looking at overall sentence patterns. So we don't have to think, you know, this is not proper grammar, but is it proper in the sense of using simple sentences one after another, after another, after another, in a paragraph to express all of your thoughts? <clears throat> if you were to subject the reader to that, it would very, be very tiresome and repetitive and boring and choppy writing. So, how to improve on that idea? So, we're going to use the same two sentences, but join them together in a way that shows a little bit higher level of sophistication in terms of its construction. So, we look at number two, the compound sentence. So, how are we going to do that? Well, we have to think about the relationship of the ideas between these two thoughts. We didn't have time, we didn't go to the pool. That's a cause and effect relationship. So we have to understand this. If we want to expand our level of sophistication in writing, we have to think about relationships of ideas. So how to join the ideas together. So one way that we can join the ideas together is to by putting it into a compound sentence. So here we go. We didn't have time, comma, so we didn't go to the pool. The word so is a cause and effect connector or a cause and effect conjunction. The relationship of the ideas here is cause and effect. So what is the cause? What is the effect? So if we label the first part of the sentence here, we didn't have time. That's an independent clause. We've already established that. This is a cause. It is a reason. So we didn't go to the pool, that's the effect. So what we are just 
what we have just done is shown a relationship of these cause and effect by connecting it with the word so. That's better than dividing it into two separate sentences, two separate simple sentences. Now, is there another way that we can do this? Yes, there is. And that's by using a complex sentence structure. So how do we do that? Well, <coughs> we're going to again, we're going to look at an adverb clause connector here. So adverb clause shows relationships of ideas. <coughs> so what kind of relationship are we trying to show here? Again, cause and effect. We can do that simply by using the word because as our subordinate clause connector. So let's do it down here. So we did a simple sentence. We did a compound sentence. Now I'm going to do a complex sentence. So I'm going to start the sentence with the word because. Because we didn't have time. Comma, we didn't go to the pool. All right, there you go. Very easy and very quick. Because we didn't have time, comma, we didn't go to the pool. All right? Now, just let me review for a moment the different parts of the sentence. So, here is our subordinate clause connector, because, all right? That shows the relationship of cause and effect. That introduces the reason or the cause, because we didn't have time. Now, you will notice this, again, is not an independent clause. It is not an independent clause. It is a subordinate clause because one reason only. I cannot remove this comma and substitute that comma for a period. If I did that, if I wrote that, or if someone wrote that, because we didn't have time, period, that would be what is considered a fragment, a sentence fragment. A subordinate clause cannot stand by itself as a separate sentence, the same way that a phrase cannot stand by itself as a separate sentence. Now, I understand in writing, fiction and this kind of thing, yes, dialogue, you may see people write complete sentences with because and a period like I just displayed here. <clears throat> that's dialogue, that's fiction. What I'm talking about here is formal academic writing. So, I want to be clear. Formal academic writing requires a different style of writing or composition than writing a short story or dialogue or fiction or however you want to classify something imaginary and made up. So, we want to focus on doing it properly in academic formal English. Because we didn't have time, comma, we didn't go to the pool. That is the correct way to combine these two sentences together. So, when I hear students tell me that at certain times in their past, teachers have told them, you can never start a sentence with because, or you should never start a sentence with because, it's not right if you start a sentence with because, I have to stop and say to them, okay, look, I understand probably why they said that, and it's probably for the same reason that I just said, that people would put a period here and say that's a complete sentence. So, <clears throat> I'm using this example to show, again, you have to be very clear and explicit when you're explaining something to students. How to do it one way that is correct versus how to do it another way which is not correct. So I disagree with the statement that someone has told me that teachers said to them, you cannot start a sentence with because. That is not technically correct. So why? Because starts this sentence right here. Is this sentence incorrect because I started it with because? No. It's correct as long as I put that comma there and connect the ideas into one sentence, which is called a complex sentence. So I understand probably the teacher was trying to emphasize the point of not creating a fragment when starting a sentence with because. However, what registered in the student's mind was never start a sentence with because. It is always wrong to start a sentence with because. So this is perhaps a misconception on the student's part, but again, the rule, I've never seen a rule that says you can never start a sentence with because. And it is perfectly fine in this type of example here because we are showing cause and effect relationships. So <clears throat> let's be clear about that. Sometimes misconceptions do happen. 
So, I want to specify clearly and carefully. <clears throat> so, we're going to clear the board and then we're going to do a little practice exercise in the next video about how to identify the differences between independent clauses, how to identify simple sentences, how to identify compound sentences, how to identify complex sentences, and how to define or distinguish them from different types of phrases or fragments. Alright, so let's do that.